this evening for Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, that climactic event in the life of Jesus that will now follow, starting with Palm Sunday to Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. Today we remember who Jesus is. The welcome that the crowds gave him that day was a welcome that he rightly deserved. So this evening, as we begin walking with Jesus this familiar road, let's praise our King who deserves our praise. We worship in Jesus' name. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Dear friends in Christ, for five weeks of Lent, we have been preparing for the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery. Today, we come together to begin the solemn celebration of Holy Week. Christ entered in triumph into his own city to complete his work as our Messiah, to suffer, to die, and to rise again. Let us remember with devotion his entry that culminated at the empty tomb and follow him with a lively faith. United with him by baptism, we share in his resurrection and new life. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. God our Father, we remember how Jesus entered Jerusalem and was welcomed as a king by those who shouted Hosanna and spread their clothing and palm branches in his path. Accept our praise and listen to our prayers as we rejoice in our triumphant king, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. pray. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You may be seated. Our first lesson is from Zechariah chapter 9. It's a prophecy of what Jesus fulfilled on that first Palm Sunday. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. 
shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the word of our Lord. In our second lesson, Paul reminds us of the great humiliation of Jesus, how he willingly endured everything this week would bring for us. Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue can acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of our Lord. In honor of our Savior Jesus, please stand for the gospel. The gospel is Mark's account of that Palm Sunday. It's the basis for the sermon today. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany and the, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. We'll join in the hymn of the day. Ride on, ride on in majesty.
your friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior King. Perhaps a little bit of background that should be established before we see the fervor of Palm Sunday. It might be in order. It was about, um, oh, the winter of, scholars estimate, approximately 29 AD. Jesus' good friend Lazarus was sick. Mary and Martha, his, his sisters, send word to Jesus, come, for the one that you love is sick. But Jesus didn't go that day. In fact, um, he didn't go the next day. He waited on the third day. And eventually Jesus did come. But the funeral had already been over for four days. The body of his friend Lazarus was starting to decay. But Jesus went uh, over to the tomb and asked that the stone be rolled away. And he said in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Both his friends and his foes were astonished. Surely this must be the king of the Old Testament. Surely the kingdom of heaven must be coming soon. We see a fervor and a groundswell of enthusiasm. Yes, it must be. This Jesus, he must be the Messiah. But then shortly after that, Jesus told his disciples that the Son of Man must go down to Jerusalem and there be, be betrayed, there being handed over to his enemies, the chief priests and the rulers of the people, who will crucify him and kill him. But on the third day, he said he would rise from the dead. Now the disciples, they weren't really ready to hear this. They were oblivious and it was like the resurrection of Lazarus and the swell ground that was happening were like fireworks in the dark sky. It just overshadowed everything. And so they proceeded down to Jerusalem. On their way down, um, two of his disciples, normally of the humble stripe, James and John, had a rather proud request kind of um, dovetailing into this enthusiasm, they figured that the kingdom of heaven was going to come soon. And so they came to Jesus and asked if one could sit on their right and their other on their left in the kingdom. You see, they thought of an earthly kingdom and they thought that well, maybe they could be administrators in this new established kingdom that Jesus was going to set up. And once again, Jesus, very strongly and yet very gently, he turned their pride by telling them about the pain it would take to follow him. And off they go. They're getting closer. But while they were still 15 miles away from Jerusalem, they went through the city of Jericho. And there, obviously, they had heard about the miracle of Lazarus. They really participated in this groundswell of enthusiasm. And so they lined up on the sides of the road so Jesus could pass through. It was like a parade that they were going through. And then there was this man who was blind who yelled out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, to make a longer story short, Jesus healed him, opened his eyes so that he could see. That just fueled the fire of enthusiasm for Jesus. And as they came closer to Jerusalem, our text here says, as they approached Bethphage and Bethany, Near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead of them, and he asked them to do what might have seemed to be a little unusual. 
He said, go into the village, and there you'll find a donkey and a donkey's foal tied up. Untie it and bring it here. And then Jesus told them, if anyone says anything to you, then tell them that the Lord has need of it and they'll return the coal soon. So Jesus went, so the disciples went off and they found it just as Jesus had said. And they brought back the foal. Now, just think about that. The disciples had grown in their trust for Jesus, and so they just went off and they did what Jesus had asked. To bring that down maybe to home here, let's say that Aaron Rodgers came into Manitowoc, and you were told to go to a certain car dealership, and there you would find the keys in the ignition, and you, would, uh, you were told to bring that back so that Aaron Rodgers could ride in it. And if anyone said anything to you, then just say, the Green Bay quarterback has need of it. Now the disciples, they trusted Jesus, but perhaps under that circumstance, we might be a little bit hesitant. But the disciples had grown in their faith. They knew that Jesus was something very, very special. And here again, he shows that he is not only a king, but he is the king of kings. He demonstrated what theologians call his omniscience. He knows all things. He knew exactly what was going to happen when they approached this village. He knew exactly the donkey and the foal of the donkey that would be there. And so, once again, he established rather privately that he was true God. And not only that, but here it says that that colt was unbroken. And as uh, Jesus went on the, the colt, the foal of a donkey, even though he was not broken, yet he did not, he did not buck. But rather he was gentle. Again, showing that Jesus was the creator of all mankind and all animals. The one who created this animal also could control this animal too. Yes, Jesus is omniscient. He knows absolutely everything about us and about our lives. He truly is a king. And he wanted to get across especially two important truths. One is that he was indeed a spiritually conquering king. And the other one was in order to do that, he came as a humble servant. And so he wanted his disciples to be assured that through what was going to happen in the next week, that he was in charge, that he was in control of all things. It's important that our king of kings is in control, isn't it? It's important that uh, the citizens of a kingdom, they swear their allegiance to the king himself. And so we too ought to bend our knees. We ought to pledge our allegiance to the king of kings. And any, uh, any disobedience to his decrees would be counted as treason. And so the sins that we commit against our king is worthy of imprisonment and even death. So Jesus came, and we are to give him that control over us. Remember the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. The meaning of that is we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Yes, we want God's kingdom to come, don't we? And as we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Father in heaven, your kingdom come. And what is God's kingdom? God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives his Holy Spirit so that by his grace we believe his holy word 
and lead a godly life now on earth and forever in heaven. And just as a king deserves obedience from its citizens, also we can expect a king to protect his citizens. And that's exactly what our Savior King does in our lives. He has control. And so as we walk our walk with our Lord and our King, it's important that we realize that He is there to protect us and He's going to do what's best for us. You know, um, parents, as you well know, need more, uh, they need to do more than just feed and clothe their children. But they also need to be controlling over those children. When a three-year-old crosses a road, a mom or dad needs to hold the hand of that three-year-old. Otherwise, they may be very tragic consequences to that. So when life looks dim, when we're at the end of our rope, when we have anxiety over what life brings us, if we don't really know the answer to our own questions, then remember that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, promises that he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. When we feel weak, when we feel worthless in this world, when we feel that no one cares, then remember that our Savior King he has control over our lives, and he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Jesus being our king is something that we hold dearly in our hearts and in our lives. And Jesus often showed his disciples his omniscience that he was true God in a kind of a private way. But here we see on Palm Sunday that he that he um, showed his humility rather in a public way. So when the donkey and the foal of the donkey came, then uh, the disciples put their cloaks on the colt, on the foal of a donkey. And there they started off to Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem, they were enthusiastic. They felt the zeal. They felt the, the swell of this promise that the kingdom of God was near. And they thought Jesus was that king. Unfortunately, they had the misconception of a political king instead of a spiritual king. So as they walked in, then they shouted their hosannas, hosanna in the highest heaven. Now the word hosanna, it means save us, deliver us, Act now. It's a pleading that was going on. It actually was part of the, the worship of that day. It was part of the, the Jewish liturgy that sang their hosannas. And now they were claiming that praise for Jesus himself. But notice how they designated who he was. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus had often proclaimed that... Uh, that the Father had sent him. And now the people were saying, yes, the Father did send him. Blessed be he. Praise be to the one who comes from the Father. And then they also said uh, that he was the descendant of David, the Messiah. Blessed is the, one, the coming kingdom of our father David. Yeah, David had been promised that one of his descendants would sit on his throne and that that throne, that kingdom, would never end. And now as they sang their hosannas, they were pleading for Jesus to, not, to establish that kingdom. And once again, it's important that we realize that Jesus did not come as an earthly king, but rather as a spiritual, as a heavenly king. There was one at Jesus' crucifixion. That happened five days later on Good Friday. 
that there was at least one who recognized Jesus as the Savior King. As you know, that uh, there were two thieves, one on the right and one on the left, left of Jesus as he was being crucified. The one had second thoughts about his life. For his entire life, no one was his king in his mind. No one could tell him what to do. He took things when he wanted, how he wanted, where he wanted. But now he was being punished. And he knew that his life was slowly ebbing away. He looked at Jesus. He heard him say, for Father, forgive them. And there was this plaque above Jesus. I think many of you can see it. Plaque above the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He looked at that, and he had a request. He said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. This man repented. He knew that he was getting what his sins deserved. He knew that this man on the cross had done nothing wrong. He trusted him as his savior king. And Jesus gave him this wonderful promise. Right there, why on that day, today, he told the thief, you will be with me in paradise. But not all the people recognized that Jesus was the Savior King on that day. The other thief on the cross, he ridiculed Jesus. If you're the Son of God, then save yourself and save us, he said. He died in unbelief. Isn't it sad that most of this world that we live in rejects Jesus as the Lord and as the Savior. Isn't it sad that even though Jesus won pardon and peace for the entire world, for all mankind, he died for all sins, for all people, for all times, and yet people throw it in the garbage can and say they, so they don't benefit from it. I read about this, uh, this event that is kind of like that from from the history of going back to uh, the Wild West. It was during the presidency of, um, of, of Jackson, Andrew Jackson. It was in the year 1830. A man who was a postal worker by the name of George Wilson, because he needed money desperately, he stole a payroll from a train. And in the process, he had killed one of the guards. He was arrested and he was sentenced to be hung. But there was a groundswell at that time against capital punishment. And since this was the, uh, the, his first offense, then um, they pleaded with Governor Jackson to, to um, grant him immunity, to give him a pardon. So, what was very strange is that George Wilson refused the pardon. He didn't want to be pardoned. It actually went to the Supreme Court. And it was uh, Chief Justice John Marshall who issued the decree of the, uh, you know, of the Supreme Court. I'll read that to you word for word. A pardon is a parchment whose only value must be determined by the receiver of the pardon. It has no value apart from that which the receiver gives to it. George Wilson has refused to accept the pardon. We cannot con uh, conceive why he would do so, but he has. Therefore, George Wilson must die. And isn't it true for mankind to there is a universal decree that everyone is pardoned. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, everyone has that forgiveness of sin. No one has to die. And yet those who refuse the pardon, just as George Wilson, 
they must die. George Wilson died physically, but those who refuse Jesus' pardon will die eternally. So as we see the groundswell of Holy Week that's coming up next week, then let's also say our hosannas. But in a way that is truly spiritual and truly biblical and Christian, we pray, save us, deliver us. And we know that we are pleading for a spiritual gift. We're pleading for a pardon that God gives to us. And who is that that gives us that pardon? He is our Savior King. Amen. Congregation may rise. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join me in confessing our Christian faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, you promised Adam that one of his offspring would come to crush the devil's head and roll back the terrible tide of sin and its consequences. You promised Abraham that through his offspring all nations on earth would be blessed. You promised David that one of his sons would reign on his throne forever. Today we come before you in reverent awe that in Jesus you have made all of those promises and every other promise in your word come true. Help us remember why our Savior had to come and die and help us celebrate that he did so that our sins could be forgiven, so the wages of sin could be rolled back, so that we and everyone else could be blessed, so that we could live safely and securely in Christ's kingdom, loved and protected and provided for by the King of kings and Lord of lords. Be with us this holy week as we celebrate your Son, our Savior. Give us courage to celebrate not only here in this building, but out in the world. Give us a voice, give us the words to say that the people of this world living in darkness may see the light of your Son and the hope we have because of Jesus. We pray all of this confident that you love us and you hear us. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who willingly died under the curse of this world's sin, so that we may live forever in the light of God's blessing. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name, and join their glorious song.
Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood, and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in the true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand and join me in singing the song of Simeon.
give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. A handful of announcements quickly to share with you this evening. Um, first is, if you didn't pick up uh, one of these little cards, if you have someone in mind that you might welcome and invite to Easter, please pick them up on the way out there on the counter in the back. Um, secondly, this is especially relevant for you regular Thursday evening people. After Easter, um, so not next week Thursday, which is Monday Thursday, but the week after that, we're going to try something different with our Thursday worship times. It will be at 4.30, one service at 4.30 on the Thursday after Easter. It's a trial run. We're going to do it throughout April and May, and in May we'll gather more input and feedback to decide if it's working and accomplishing what we want it to accomplish. Um, so if that does work for you, wonderful. If that's a problem, reach out to us and, and let us know. Um, and then one final thing. A handful of weeks ago, we called Gary and Becky Toma. Um, I have their response this evening. Dear members of First German, it has been a privilege to wrestle with the divine calls you have given us. We thank all of you for your prayers during this time. We especially thank the faculty, staff, and congregational leaders for all of their time and kindness in helping us deliberate. The Lord has blessed this congregation with a wonderful faculty and a beautiful facility. God is certainly good and gracious. After much prayer and deliberation, the Lord has led us to return the calls to First German and remain at St. Peter's in Sturgeon Bay. We feel strongly that our gifts best serve the needs of St. Peter's congregation at this time. We wanted to share this information in a timely manner so the congregation can decide how to proceed before Holy Week begins. It will also help us to worship with a peaceful heart this Holy Week. We cannot thank you enough for allowing us this opportunity. It has been an honor to be entrusted with these calls. We know God has great plans for his ministry in both congregations. Romans 5.13 states, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We will pound God's door on behalf of First German. We are confident that the Lord, in his wisdom, will provide well-equipped, called workers for the educational ministry at First German. We ask you to keep us and our ministry in your prayer as well. In Christ alone, Gary and Becky Toma. So, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Um, we're beginning to talk about uh, when the next call meeting will be. We'll be sure to communicate that as soon as we know. That's it for today. God be with you all till we meet again.